So uh, I would like to thank, thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. So it will be sort of a continuation of the previous talk uh, in the sense that uh, this will be a bit about what will happen with security when uh, the time comes, uh, as you were all speculating, uh, when we have a big quantum computer that can do uh, major things. So uh, before talking about uh, post-quantum crypto, I will give you a short introduction to uh, crypto cryptology or cryptography, whatever you choose. Um, so uh, one way of describing the area is to, to say that it's a study of cryptographic primitives. And a cryptographic primitive we can describe as some kind of, of a black box or, or a, a low level algorithm that takes a certain input and gives a certain output. and it performs some, some task in a cryptographic uh, uh, setting. So, uh, so it's usually some uh, mathematically oriented thing. And uh, then we use these uh, boxes as parts of building secure systems. So uh, examples of cryptographic primitives, for example, a cryptographic hash function is probably something you you are familiar with. Uh, it will compute the hash value for, for a message. We have symmetric key encryption, and we have public key encryption. We have, uh, as part of public key encryption, something uh, called uh, digital signatures, or at least it's related, and say, uh, commitment schemes. So these are just a number of, of uh, examples, and the list could go very, very long. Uh, if the definition is also not very precise. It's just a matter of, of uh, describing how we, we think about these things. So uh, if you then want to use these things in, in a, an actual system, so we can take uh, HTTPS uh, uh, as an example. So it uses uh, TLS. And if you would just go in uh, and have a look on uh, what's actually used in the protocol. So you can see that it's using uh, quite a lot of different uh, cryptographic primitives, like uh, doing a key exchange, doing a, a signature. You do uh, symmetric encryption using AS, for example, or, or uh, uh, yeah, and, and additional things. So, so this is uh, what we do with uh, crypto. So we try to build this. Uh, blocks that can be used uh, to, for, for further uh, things. So uh, if we go to the historic view, so the symmetric part has been around for a very long time. Uh, so for example, Shannon uh, already in the 40s uh, made some uh, theory around what we can say about secrecy and these kind of things. Uh, but it sort of, in, in research, it didn't uh, take off too much. It was mainly something that uh, were uh, investigated in military and, and uh, similar uh, uh, organizations. Uh, but uh, the big game changer came in the 70s when Diffie and Hellman introduced public key cryptography. And so the, the key idea was that, well, actually we don't need a symmetric key that is shared between, uh, say, sender and, and uh, receiver. But uh, we could actually uh, have um, a public key as the encryption key. So, so uh, I like in this picture here, you will see, um, oops, sorry, no, I'm going. <laughs> Um, so here you have um, Alice communicating with Bob, and the idea is that uh, you can actually use a public key, which is Bob's public key. So Bob, Bob put up this uh, key, and it has some relation with the private key. 
And this means that actually anyone could uh, use this public key to encrypt, and only Bob can then decrypt because knowledge of the private key is necessary to decrypt. So this was like a, a major enabling uh, technique. So, so this is sort of the, the story of, of, uh, <coughs> of crypto. And very soon um, after that, we saw the, say, famous RSA crypto system. So I will not uh, spend too much time here, but basically, so what is happening is if you want to encrypt something, so you have a plain text, then you are computing this exponentiation modulo a number n, and this number n is constructed in the construction phase as a product of two very large primes. And then there are some basic mathematics. Uh, so you have another parameter here, which is the inverse of this uh, value E that you use in encryption, inverse modulo phi of n, which is the Euler phi function, and then you can use this value to decrypt. Uh, so uh, all, all of this depends then on this number n, so uh, it's, uh, it's important that you, the Eve, which is now the, the enemy, is not uh, able to factor this number, because if you can factor it, you can compute these secret values, and then you can decrypt. So the whole security of, of this idea relies in the fact that we assume that this number cannot be factored. And yeah, this, this has been uh, something that has worked, until now at least, because if we just make a choice of our number n, the product of these two primes, to be uh, large enough, then the current factoring algorithms have not been able to, to solve this because they, they run in so-called sub-exponential time, so they are not polynomial time, as we saw previously, uh, but, but uh, more difficult, but, but still not super difficult. So, uh, <clears throat> so when we want to compute this, so what, what, uh, what kind of uh, computational problems do we have? So for example, if we want to compute such an exponentiation, well, we can look at the complexity of, of uh, uh, just computing a regular multiplication. So it's a, yeah, some basic form, it's, it's uh, squared in the number of bits of the number, but uh, with some better methods you can maybe improve it a bit. But still, if you are going to have something which resembles something secure, maybe this is the kind of number you would like to use, so then you can see that it will be quite a computational task to compute these things. In, in particular, if this exponent here is now just a, a general uh, element, modulo n, so it will also be of the same size as, as this number. It's going to be quite tough to compute. Um, so, so that's uh, a problem. So uh, in order to come to a partial solution for this, uh, there was another crypto system from the 80s uh, that used, used a different problem. So it's based on the so-called discrete log problem. So uh, if you pick some domain parameters, so this is some fixed parameters, P, and then a uh, generator in, uh, this is uh, a group which is multiplication modulo P. So you, you compute, you, s you select a random X here, and you compute a public key in this way, and then you can see here how encryption and decryption is done. So you operate, uh, so you compute a, a, a ciphertext here as this pair G to the K and M times H to the K, where M is now your message you would like to encrypt, uh, and K is a random value. 
and then using uh, the knowledge of, of uh, how you constructed the public key, this X, so you can do your decryption. So, so what's interesting with this scheme is that you are only using a single operation. So actually everything here takes place in a group and not uh, in a ring with, with two operations. So, <coughs> so this, um, this crypto system then is based on the discrete log problem. So in general, you have such a problem, so you are given H and you know this generator G, uh, but you don't know X here, and you would like to solve this, but it, yeah, in this particular case, it's, it's uh, the problem in modulo uh, prime. So uh, again, this problem, if you have it in this form using this group, is sub-exponential, and it will again require uh, a lot of computation. So we, you may think that nothing is, is one compared to the RSA crypto system, but actually, because it is a group, we don't need to, to, uh, <coughs> to stay in this uh, multiplicative group that I used to describe it, but actually we can consider any group and the corresponding discrete log problem in, in this particular group. So, uh, so I can pick any group, and actually when you look at the computational complexity of this problem, it varies depending on what group you choose. So, for example, uh, the one I used here to describe the problem, this multiplicative group, so it's sub-exponential, so that's like, it's difficult, but not too difficult, but if you move to some other groups, and that's elliptic curve groups, for example, it can potentially be fully exponential. And what is then the advantage of that? Well, yeah, <coughs> here is the, uh, some very simple examples of this is how an uh, elliptic curve can look. This is some very basic example over a uh, uh, finite field with seven elements. And, well, <coughs> this com computational complexity for these kind of, of uh, groups can now be fully exponential. And the, the the conclusion with this is that then your numbers do not need to be so large. So you can, you can pick uh, a much smaller uh, modulus because it's much more difficult to solve this problem. So actually the, the arithmetic will be much faster if you use these kind of groups compared to, to um, uh, the multiplicative group or RSA or something which is much more heavy. So, so that's roughly what has happened in, in crypto until a few years ago. And then we came to the possibility of having quantum computing. So uh, <laughs> what does that mean for these problems? Well, you already saw it in the previous um, presentation, that uh, actually factoring is a problem that can be solved through what is known as Shaw's algorithm, published already in the 90s. Um, so it can be solved in polynomial time. So um, <coughs> that's not the only thing, but the discrete log problem can also be solved in polynomial time. And essentially, all our primitives that we have in, in actual use today are based on either factoring or discrete log. So if we now have this large quantum computer that can do these tasks, which they can in theory, so essentially everything we have implemented in today's society that uses public key cryptography, and that's really a lot of different things, is in theory broken. So it's a really huge problem. 
And yeah, so what, what can we do about that? <coughs> so, <coughs> so we need to find uh, a new solution for this, how to construct these primitives. And well, this area that we now enter when we sort of assume that we have quantum computers, this is what is known as post-quantum cryptography. So the study of what we can have and construct and analyze assuming the presence of a large quantum computer. Um, so quantum computers does not affect only public key crypto, but there is uh, another algorithm called the Grover algorithm that also affects symmetric cryptos. So it's not that severe. So uh, for example, if you have a symmetric crypto system using a 128-bit key, so in theory, the Grover's algorithm can, can find the key in complexity 2 to the 64. So it's like the square root of the number of possibilities. Um, so, so for symmetric uh, algorithms, we can basically solve things by just increasing the, the key size. But uh, it's not the same for, for public key then, where everything is sort of broken. So we need to look for new solutions. And this has been realized uh, some years ago. And there is now huge uh, efforts in trying to find, uh, well, new algorithms. And because they cannot be based on factoring or discrete logs, so we must base them on new problems. And this is what I plan to say a few words on. Um, and for example, NIST, uh, a big standardization organization in US, has currently an uh, uh, a big uh, standardization project that is looking into uh, possible new algorithms for this. So, and if we look at what kind of solutions we have, so you can basically split it up in a number of uh, areas we, where you find algorithms based on different problems. So, so you have uh, something called lattice-based crypto, so essentially, these are problems that have some kind of relation to difficult problems for lattices. You have uh, what's known as code-based crypto, which is uh, the same, but here problems are, or, or algorithms are related to difficult problems uh, for codes of some time, type. Uh, there are also other ones, multivariate and hash-based, but basically these two are where most of the things are, are happening. So, uh, so here is um, one problem that I will introduce that is maybe the most common one in building these new algorithms. So it's called uh, learning with errors. So um, if I'm going to explain how it works, so if you take just a linear system of equations and you assume everything is uh, in R, so then we know that uh, if you have full rank in the matrix, then we can solve this uh, and find the solution easily. So there is nothing uh, yeah, more to say about that. But um, if I introduce a couple of slight modifications, so I, um, first of all, I define my system instead over a finite field. So for example, in this case, it's over set 13. And now I also have a, a maybe a different uh, representation of my elements in set 13. So I enumerate them from minus 6 to 6. Everything is done modulo uh, 13. And now, uh, if I only do that change, it will not change the problem at all. It's just defined over a finite field. But now I will also introduce a small modification to each of the equations I have. So instead of having the equation to be correct uh, all the time, I allow for a small error. So I will insert also an error vector. 
which can either be zero, so it's correct, but it could also be plus minus one. So, uh, uh, so if I do that, you can see that, okay, so if I would stay with my five equations, there would be no uh, uh, unique solution, so, but I will, I will have some more equations so that there will be only, uh, with large probability, at least uh, a single solution. So this might be a problem that we are facing. So, so the problem is then, if I have these equations here, so, so what I don't know is my vector s here, uh, and I, there is some unknown error being added. So how do I find, in the best way, my, my vector s? So this is the learning with errors problem. So it could, for example, look like this in the solution. So, <coughs> so this can be slightly formalized. So you, um, you can write it up as a learning with errors oracle. So you can ask for equations from this oracle, and you will get some linear combination of these entries in the S vector added a noise. And your task is you should try to recover the vector S, and you can ask this oracle as many times as you want. The noise is, for example, from a discrete Gaussian, which basically means that, yeah, at least the entries are, are very small. So, and I will also show you uh, uh, a gen yeah. uh, um, a similar version which is uh, based on uh, rings uh, is described here. So I'll uh, I'll skip this construction. But if you ha if you can see the slides, uh, you can see how how we. Uh, construct such a crypto system based on this uh, scheme. So I'll uh, end with the, the, the current things that we are investigating here. So uh, this standardization project, as I mentioned, uh, there are currently 26 surviving candidates in uh, the second round of this project. Um, and there are a lot of related things, like investigating these underlying problems, how difficult they are to solve, and different other implementation uh, problems. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, so we have time for at least one question. Um, we'll see where we'll, we'll end up in this quantum world. But, oh, we have one question, sorry. Thank you. Um, can you comment on some of the events in the past where some vulnerabilities have been injected into the standardization process by some of these actors? I think this would take us too far, you know. <laughs> this, is a, this is a different type of question. Would you, do you have a short answer? No, I, I don't know exactly what you're referring to, so... And may, maybe injecting better. vulnerabilities yeah. through NIST. Aha, right. uh -huh, okay. <laughs> no, I think this is a, an, an open uh, uh, project, so uh, I, I would not expect uh, that in, in this project. Yeah, there are different opinions what's a good crypto system. Some people think it's one that you can break. So, but thank you very much.